What does it mean that a person will not inherit the kingdom of God, as it says in 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 to 11? The first mention of not inheriting the kingdom of God is found in Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters nor adulterers nor male prostitutes nor homosexual offenders nor thieves nor the greedy nor drunkards nor slanderers nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 to 11. The church is made up of people who are glorious messes. We are each a mess because one of the things that makes the church unique is that we all enter membership in the church because of God's grace, not because we paid a fee or made the cut. Paul gives us a list of sins in our passage that indicates that regardless of the extent of your sin or struggles, before placing your trust in the person and work of Jesus, you were excluded from his kingdom and could not earn your acceptance into Christ's kingdom. We are glorious though because of 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11, our past no longer defines us rather in Christ, we are justified and sanctified and found in Christ by the Spirit of God. Paul's desire in 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 to 11 is to show us what really makes the members of Christ's body, the church, unique and different from the world, being marked by God's grace. By saying the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God, Paul is stating that the wicked are not children of God, nor are they heirs of eternal life, Romans 8 verse 17. This does not mean that anybody who has ever committed one of these sins will be denied entrance to heaven. What differentiates a Christian's life from that of a non-Christian is the struggle against sin and the ability to overcome it. A true Christian will always repent, will always eventually return to God, and will always resume the struggle against sin. But the Bible gives no support for the idea that a person who perpetually and unrepentantly engages in sin can indeed be a Christian. The 1 Corinthians passage lists sins that, if indulged in continuously, identify a person as not being redeemed by Christ. The Christian's response to sin is to hate it, repent of it, and forsake it. We still struggle with sin, but by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in us, we are able to resist and overcome sin. The hallmark of a true Christian is the decreasing presence of sin in his life. As Christians grow and mature in the faith, sin has less and less of a hold on us. Of course, sinless perfection is impossible in this life, but our hatred for sin becomes greater as we mature. Like Paul, we are distressed that sin still exists in our flesh, causing us at times to do what we don't want to do and looking to Christ for relief from this body of death as Romans 7 verses 18 to 25 says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am! Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. If a person actively, perpetually, and unrepentantly lives a homosexual lifestyle, the lifestyle of a thief, 
a greedy lifestyle, a drunken lifestyle, etc., that person is showing himself to be unsaved, and such a person will definitely not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul wants Corinth, and by extension us today, to see that we are all unworthy and have a list of sins that excluded us from God's kingdom until we were forgiven and made new by the work of God. How does this understanding strengthen church community and help us seek out those outside the church?